Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment. This is episode 145. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my special guest host today is Sam Whalen, host of our Insights Into Tomorrow podcast. Hello there. How you doing, Sam? Good. How are you doing? Good. Thank you for joining us today. So this discussion kind of came about, you know, we've, we've been itching to have this discussion for quite some time now. Uh, we've finished the Obi-Wan series now, so yep. we can finally have the, the whole conversation. So today we're going to discuss the current state of Star Wars. Believe it or not, we're actually coming up on the 10th anniversary of Disney taking over Lucasfilm. Uh, We'll take a look at how the franchise has progressed since Disney took ownership and what their stewardship looks like. Then we'll take a deep dive into the properties that have come out recently and the trend towards streaming. Uh, we'll give our thoughts and opinions on Obi-Wan, and then we'll take a look at what the current forecasted future of the franchise looks like and where we think it's going. But before we do that, though, I would invite our listening and viewing audience to subscribe to the podcast. You can find audio versions of this podcast listed as Insights into Entertainment. Both video and audio can be found of all of the network's podcasts listed as Insights into Things. And we can be found anywhere you get a podcast, Google, Spotify, and so forth. We'd also uh, invite you to <coughs> write in, give us your feedback, tell us how we're doing, give us your suggestions. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com or check out our official website at www.insightsintothings.com uh, for all of our social media links. Ready to get into it? Uh, yeah, before we get into it, uh, full spoilers for everything. So if you haven't seen the new sequel movies, you haven't seen Obi-Wan, we're going full spoilers, just so you know. All right, good warning there. Here we go. So Disney's trying to get their money's worth from the franchise. So we all know that back in 2012 or thereabouts, uh, Disney basically bought Lucasfilm for about a little over $4 billion. Um, They wanted to quickly capitalize on this by putting out their own trilogy, which kind of worked out for them, I guess. We'll get into that later. Um, So they put out the first film in 2015 with Force Awakens. That brought in $2 billion. Um... At the time, it was the highest grossing film in Disney history, which was kind of impressive. Then we got that complete mess of a movie, Last Jedi, in 2017. People are hard on that. It's not that bad, guys. Come on. (laughs) Then they they finished murdering the franchise in 2019. (laughs) With uh, Rise of Skywalker. That one's pretty bad. I really don't I don't enjoy that movie. <laughs> hey, the one thing about Rise of Skywalker is you didn't have Luke Skywalker milking any yeah. unusually unattractive animals. That's what the people wanted. Yeah, that's exactly what we wanted. Uh, do you think their investment was worth it at this point? I mean, they made their money, right? So, Well, yeah, breaking even is not really a, a sound investment. True. Though. Uh, I don't know. I think for Disney, you know, they want to. They clearly want to be a media. Some may say monopoly. Others may say conglomerate. <laughs> I just looked it up. They acquired Marvel in two thousand and nine. So three years after that, they buy Star Wars. I think. I mean, they've made it part of the Disney brand for better or worse. I think for them, if they want to make a, if they want to appeal to every possible demographic, owning Star Wars is going to help that. Uh, you know, maybe if you're not a comic book fan, a lot of people are Star Wars fans, and that's a huge audience you're grabbing right there. So. Yeah, and I think no matter what you do, and 
they've kind of proven, though, at least when it was under under Lucasfilm, when it was under George Lucas, the way that they handled their licensing, they basically showed that even though it was very expensive, and it still was very expensive to license Disney to produce anything for it, or uh, Star Wars, rather, you can't help but make money doing it. Yeah, like the fan base is very dedicated. Right. It's just a moneymaker no matter what. What might differ is your profit margins. Mm. You know, you're not going to be raking in 70, 80, 90, 100% profit margins. You might be raking in a guaranteed 30%. But you know what? A 30% return, guaranteed return on investment is a pretty good return on investment. Yeah, and, and they definitely know their market. They know that most Star Wars fans, it's going to be pretty much impossible to turn them off from the franchise. Maybe not, you know, every property. Certainly, most people aren't reading every book and every comic. I'm not. Right. But anything that's a TV show or a movie, most Star Wars fans are probably going to go check that out. And, and I agree. And I think, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, where they made some mistakes uh, in a minute or so here. But I think Disney is smart enough to know what property they have and how to, how to milk it, how to get their money's worth out of it. They've been doing it for almost, well, over 100 years now. Yeah. And do we want to go movie by movie? Because I, I, Force Awakens is a great example of that, kicking it off. Oh, absolutely. Go right into it. You know, you get J.J. Abrams. He, he did it with Star Trek. You know, he took Star Trek and kind of made it more for mass appeal, for better or worse, if you're a Star Trek fan. Some people had problems with that. But he basically did the same thing for Star Wars. I mean, it's clearly... It's a new hope again, um, but it's updated with modern visuals. It's a very, um, it's hard to not like that movie. I love that movie and I know it has its issues, um, but it just, I think it did a great job capturing what Star Wars was and well, what it could have been. And I agree. I think Force Awakens was a good movie to kick off the new franchise because it reintroduces the people who are familiar with it and it's comfortable for those people. Mm-hmm. And it's a great way of easing other people into it. The critical difference between what he did with Star Trek and what he did with Star Wars is Star Trek he did he had a loophole. Mm. Star Trek was a was a was a alternate time. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. So with Star Trek you can say, oh okay, this is an interesting story, but that's really not what happened because here's the official timeline. Mm-hmm. And that's where he gets the out. So with this, you don't get that. The problem I think that we really ran into at Force Awakens was you took a universe that you know, and you didn't relaunch it. You moved it 30 years in the future, and it's a completely different universe. Mm-hmm. And you have no idea how you got there. Yep. And Disney tried to fill in some of that backstory with the novels and the video games that people aren't going to consume. So people walked out of the movie theater scratching their head thinking, what the hell's the First Order? Who's mm-hmm. this new Snoke guy? Like... It did, it did a very bad job of introducing things because there was almost an assumption that you knew what was going on. Yep, and I think that comes with it being a, what's the phrase, soft reboot, where you just make the same movie again, but right. in the same universe. Right. Because everybody will just say, they won't think about it too hard. It's just the Empire again. It's just the Rebels again. But it's like, if we're thinking about the context of the universe, it's like the Rebels won. Why are they still Rebels, you know? Um, but the, the other thing is, and we're going to hit it probably a million times in this discussion, is the lack of planning. I think because, you know, the way Abrams does things is he has mystery boxes where he introduces things and he may or may not answer those questions later. But when there's no plan and he doesn't know if he's coming back for more movies, those those questions definitely never get answered. Yeah. Or they get answered in ways that was never intended to be answered, which you get in The Last Jedi. So I think from the very beginning, the lack of planning is is kind of the thing that, you know, was this was doomed from the start, maybe. There was kind of a clash of styles with some of the classic stuff, too. Like, like you, the biggest reveal in the history of Star Wars was End of Empire Strikes Back, where Darth Vader is Luke's father. Well, they did a similar reveal in Force Awakens in the first ten minutes of the movie, where Kylo Ren is the son of Han and Luke. Uh, Han, Han and Luke, that would have been interesting. He's adopted. <laughs> the, the son of Han and Leia. And he wears this mask like Darth Vader, which comes off in the first 15 minutes of them. And it's like every reveal that there could have been has, was like out of the bag. Like the first first scene is what you get. So it kind of a, was a clash of styles, too. Yeah, I don't know. I like that because it, to me it was they're trying to make Kylo more of a character. You know, Darth Vader, 
you don't get his character until Jedi, where you find out he's you know he was a f- he kind of gets redeemed in that movie. Whereas with Kylo, they skip all the reveals right away, so we can see him as more of a person. And you know he throws temper tantrums and stuff. But I think the big reveal for Force Awakens is is Han dying, right? I mean that's like that's in the similar vein. I I would agree. I would agree. And the way that he died, I think, was acceptable. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, like a lot of a lot of people will flash back to the to the uh, expanded universe novels, and the first uh, original character that was ever killed off in the expanded universe was Chewbacca, and he was killed off in the first series of the New Jedi Order books, and they killed him by dropping a moon on him mm-hmm. while he was saving one of Han's kids, which was the you know you couldn't come up with a better way to have a death scene than that in a book, mm-hmm. and then. Hand gets stabbed and falls off a bridge with his son. So it was kind of like it was kind of anticlimactic how they wind up killing him. Yeah, I, I just I don't know. It's uh, I guess for, if we're doing if we're keeping in trend of it being New Hope, I guess he's supposed to take the place of the Ben Kenobi death, right? And the and Ben Kenobi dying propelled Luke down this path of being a Jedi. Yeah, where Hand dying really lended nothing to the character development. As much as they wanted it to, it lended nothing to the character development of Kylo Ren. Uh, yeah. Because they tried to revisit it in The Last Jedi, yep. and it just didn't work. And Rise of Skywalker. <laughs> yeah. When he comes back as a ghost. And it doesn't work for him. Yeah. I, again, I think it all goes back to that lack of planning. You know, you could have you could have saved something like that for a later movie if you knew you were going to do it. Right. If you knew you were making that trilogy, I could totally see that being... And it probably was, because... When it originally happened, the the understanding was that J.J. Abrams was going to make the trilogy. Mm. And then he had a scheduling conflict with Last Jedi, and we wind up having... Ryan Johnson. Ryan Johnson step in to do Last Jedi. And and by all accounts, all of Ryan Johnson's other films were fantastic. Mm -hmm. What happened with Last Jedi, I don't know. I still think Last Jedi, in terms of direction, is like one of the best. Like in terms of cinematography and stuff, it's like that in Rogue One. Like no other Star Wars movie looks like that in terms of how it's shot. I have a diff. Well, okay, it's different. I'll give you that. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to argue with that. The fact that they start the joke, the 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 movie off with a like oh, yeah. mom joke, is kind of yeah a slap in the face. Well, the whole thing's a slap in the face, right? Well, it, it is, <laughs> and really, it, it it's. The entire movie took everything that was established in Force Awakens and threw it out the window. Yep. And it was like, oh, okay, you only got another movie mm. left in this trilogy. Yeah. What are you going to do? Yeah, and and there is there is merit in you know trying something new with Star Wars and and you know not just doing the same thing over and over again, even though it would have made you infinite money. But it's not great when you make it a pillar movie of the franchise. Maybe give Ryan Johnson a Star Wars story first. Yep. And have him work it out. Yep. But I think if you're going to have this, especially coming off Force Awakens, which was very much just New Hope again, and played it very safe with pretty much everything, to have it be such a drastic change, I think was was a difficult call. Well, and I and I, as much as I harp and I rail against Ryan Johnson's abuse of the franchise, it's not his fault. It's the fault of Kathleen Kennedy and the other executives. Yeah. Who saw this before it went mm-hmm. out the door and allowed it to go out the door? Yeah, I wonder what the behind the scenes were on, like on that, like how that got that far. Like in. it was embarrassing to see something like that. Luke Skywalker, <laughs> Jedi Master, is milking a cow. Okay, yeah, it's tough. It was. It was just, and and the whole premise of the movie being a rehash of of really someone my age. It was a rehash of of the O.J. Simpson chase it was a slow white bronco chase where oh, yeah. you know you just there no one in the history of star wars ever ran out of gas mm-hmm. i'm sorry like that whole premise itself was just weak yeah uh and it's things like that where like when you're going to release a main movie in the franchise people are going to ask questions they're going to be much more critical of it so like give them give them a side story you know give them a tv show well they weren't doing tv shows at the time but do a side story you know it's, it's Maybe they were taking a risk because they had maybe because they know he's a good filmmaker. Maybe they thought he could pull it off. But I think, and I'm sure they're, I'm sure he didn't write and direct, not entirely. I, I'd have to see who the other writers are because the writing is a big part of that as well. Right, I agree. But I just think but, it, 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 but it was a reputation. I mean, he got the movie based on his reputation, and his reputation was for making some um, 
non standards films. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, he was a revolutionary director in what he's done. And I've only seen Looper. That's the only other film I have as I've seen. I, I don't know what they expected out of him other than something that was unconventional. And right. it was unconventional. Yeah. But unconventional is not Star Wars. Yeah. And you, it's difficult not to compare it to the MCU because it's like the same company now. And eventually they clearly were trying to go for something like that. Right. Where it's like all the MCU movies are directed by different people. But when you get an Avengers movie or a Civil War or where it's like everybody shows up. There's a timeline they have to abide by. Exactly. There's a Kevin Feige at the top right. who's saying, hey, we got to. Even in the in the, in the uh, individual movies, Kevin Feige is coming in and he's saying, right. "Hey, we got to stick with this." There's an overall master who's who's directing the the plot. Like you have to go from point A to point B. How you do that is up mm -hmm. to you in the movie. But at the end of the movie, you have to be at point B. Is what the rule is. Yeah, and and there are some negative aspects to that because you see MCU directors fired all the time for creative differences, aka they're not sticking to the cookie cutter right. what Disney wants formula. But the benefit of that is that you get a cohesive narrative. <laughs> and when you're doing it over the course of ten or more movies, you need that, yeah. or it's complete chaos. Look at what happened to the Marvel properties before Disney took mm -hmm. over. You know, look at the Star, the Spider-Man movies. Look at the Fantastic Four movies. Yep, it was a mess. They were all over the place. There was there was consistency issues. There were continuity issues. There was nobody who was helming the entire thing, and that's the one thing that that Disney has at least done with the Marvel side of things. Yeah, and I'm hoping, and we'll get to Dave Filoni later. He's the guy in charge of you know Clone Wars and Rebels and things like that. I think he's the closest we have to a yeah. Kevin Feige in this universe with how he's worked on Mandalorian and, and elements of Boba Fett and the Ahsoka show coming up. We'll get to all that later. But I think that's the it's a, something that I think is hopeful for the franchise going forward. Absolutely. Let's finally you know bash a little bit on Rise of Skywalker and finish up this <laughs> this diatribe before we move on. I. I that's my least favorite movie in all of all of them. Even the prequels, it's I just can't stand it. It's like terrible. <laughs> I I think J.J. Abrams kind of got stuck with a raw deal. He had a vision when he started Force Awakens that was thrown out with Last Jedi, and he had to spend half mm -hmm. of uh, Rise of Skywalker fixing all the stuff that Brian Johnson broke in Last Jedi. It felt like two movies. Yeah, it did because he had he had to basically retcon Last Jedi. Which, like, is just so sloppy. And again, we go back to the lack of planning. That's, like, ridiculous. When you're spending billions of dollars on these movies and you have to spend half of... Just from a production and, like, a narrative standpoint, having to redo yeah. and or undo, you know, a, a half or a third of your trilogy is, like, ridiculous. Like, yeah. how does that happen? Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I think it's because he had a vision of where he wanted it to go, didn't... Lost the control yeah. in the middle there and had to try to regain it. And I'm really, you had to resurrect Palpatine, like... Somehow, Palpatine no, has returned. No, mind you, if anyone follows the Expanded Universe, Palpatine comes back a couple of times. Mm -hmm. And every time that he comes back in the Expanded Universe, it's a stretch, okay? It's, like, ridiculous, yeah. Huh? It, it is. And for him to come back here, and not only did, he, did they bring him back, they had foreshadowed him coming back when they had Ian McDermott, who plays mm -hmm. Palpatine, show up at Star Wars Celebration months before the movie came out because the trailer they put in the Emperor laughing. Yeah. And then they bring, and it was like there was, there was no surprise whatsoever. You knew exactly what was going to happen. The question was, oh, it'll be really cool how they show it. And then they did it. <laughs> right, right. And, and then it wasn't cool when they showed it. They're, it was, they're still trying to explain it. You know, we've, we've gotten some hints of cloning and, and siphoning Baby Yoda uh, blood, I guess, <laughs> for midichlorians. Right. But we still don't have a concrete explanation as to how he came back. Well, and the kicker is, had they gone down the original route of the Expanded Universe and went, which is the direction they're going now, mind yeah. you, went the path of the Thrawn trilogy, which legitimately should have been the sequel trilogy mm -hmm. to, to what we originally know of as, as Star Wars, you would have gotten Thrawn. You would have gotten Jorah Sabath. You would have been introduced to the cloning uh, of, a, of a Sith user and of a Force user mm -hmm. and the complications. You would have gotten all that stuff, and it would have logically led to this point. Yeah. And when they acquired the property, they just decided to throw everything out that was that was Lucas's stuff, and they didn't want it anymore. Yeah. And that was their dumbest mistake. We might talk more on that throwing out later, but yeah, that that whole the initial the months after the acquisition where they just 
destroying projects left and right is rough. Mm-hmm. Uh, but going back to the EU stuff, it's like the Marvel comics. You know, you can you have a blueprint, and it's not a perfect blueprint. Comics are very weird. But, like, you have a story that at least most people, not most people, but, like, people have read, and it worked. So you can at least pull elements from right. that. It's it's something, it's a path you could take, and it's three books. <laughs> so right. it could have been another trilogy right there. Right, and it's something that people are familiar with, yeah. too. So they've got something to latch on to. Um, Marvel's more difficult because you have relaunches mm-hmm. of storylines multiple times in the comic industry. And what, what Marvel tends to do is they pull different pieces, different elements from each of those relaunches and puts them into a cohesive story. Mm -hmm. Um, So no matter what era you read the comics, you'll recognize parts of it. And it's that recognition, not nostalgia so much. It's that recognition of, oh, I know who that guy is. He was this guy over Mm -hmm. here. I wonder where he's going to wind up in this story. It's that little click in the brain that makes the Marvel stuff work so well. And how they they will subvert that those expectations as well, right. where like they'll take a if you know like everyone not everyone but when everyone figured out Thanos was the bad guy, people went and go went and looked up the original Infinity War. Right. But it's not like that. Like uh, it's, well, it's but, much different. But you've had fails along those lines too, like mm-hmm. the Mandal uh, the the Mandarin. Oh yeah. So that didn't go over quite as well true, as they wanted it to. Yeah, they had to go back and break on that multiple times. They had to clean that up a couple of times. So. Um but yeah, it's it's always like with that you, you've got the blueprint and then they change it up where they need to and you know they they keep what they want but it's they use the comics as at least a jumping off point whereas with Star Wars there seemed to be no planning at all. <laughs> right. Well and and to complicate things and and this you know we'll go into the next segment here about you know Disney learning from their mistakes is while they're making these, Disney's also in the process of releasing these one-off movies. Mm -hmm. And their premise at the time, and they even stated this, was they would have a canon Star Wars saga, a Skywalker saga movie every, what is it, three years, and then they'd have a one-off movie in between there. And the idea was to keep interest in Star Wars. Well, everyone who's a Star Wars fan knows that you get a trilogy, there's three years between each episode, and then there's like 15 years before anything else happens. And that's kind of the pace that we've lived at. Well, you wind up getting uh, the first example of this in Rogue One, a Star Wars story, which, in my opinion, is one of the best movies in the entire Star Wars mm-hmm. franchise. Yeah, Rogue One's pretty good. It's, I mean, it's it really doubles down on all that nostalgia and like fan service stuff, but... It's fun, and yeah. I like that movie. And it's not a main trilogy, so you right. can. It's okay it's, for it to be like that flawed. It's a movie that didn't need to be made. Mm-hmm. It didn't change the overall narrative. It didn't change the overall story. Everything else remains. It's a fringe movie that happens to be made that has beautiful artistry to it, beautiful writing. It ties perfectly into what we know is Star Wars. Mm-hmm. And you get a badass version of Vader out of it, too. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, that's true. That probably knocks it up like three points for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, two years later, we get Solo, another Star Wars movie that didn't need to be made, which was terrible. I, I mean, it has good parts, but, like, overall, it's it's pretty, it's not great. It's, again, it's one that didn't need to be made, and it, it goes against the idea. It's basically what they did with Darth Vader and Boba Fett, and all the characters that had these brief moments in Star Wars history that were badass characters because you didn't know anything yep. about them. Yep. And you didn't need to know anything about That's them. That's what makes them cool. Right. <laughs> is that you can say whatever you want in your head about them. Right. So no matter what, you're going to look at Darth Vader, and he's a whiny little little kid now. Yeah. You're going to look at Boba Fett if you watch The Clone Wars, and he's a whiny little kid now yep. that misses his dad. Like... You ruin these characters by doing this stuff, and and Lucas tried to ruin Han Solo already in the digital edition of Star Wars by making Greedo shoot first. Oh, yeah, <laughs> okay. So we're not even going to get into that debate. I will say on that though that Han shooting first defined Han's character. Yeah, he was like a bad guy, basically. <laughs> right, right. He was a he murderer. Was, he was that guy on the fringe that was going to play dirty if he mm-hmm. had to to get the job done. Which is the whole point of his arc in New Hope is that he learns, he comes back for right. like, he helps. You it's know? a redemption story for Han. Which you don't get in Solo also because they give him an arc in that movie where at the end of Solo, he's a good guy. 
where he shouldn't be. He should like he should be a bad guy, which doesn't make any sense to me because he gets betrayed in that movie by the lo- his love interest Kira. Right. You'd think that would and harden his mentor. him and his mentor. Yeah, <laughs> everybody basically. You'd think that would harden him and make him bad, but because it's a movie, you can't have an ending with your character being a bad guy. Right. I guess I don't know. You could have, but they didn't want to. Yeah, so that was where you kind of you left some head scratching there. And the other problem that happened with Solo was, again, if you were a fan of the expanded universe, there was a there was a natural story progression of the relationship between Han and Chewie. You know, Han gets his blaster as another storyline. So you have all these different things that define the Han Solo character over the course of years. And they cram it into this movie where it happens in a course of a couple of days. It's like the ending of Revenge of the Sith where in the last 10 minutes, everything has to get set up for New Hope really fast. Right, <laughs> exactly. And it may, it just kills the whole premise of what this character has done. So this character has no backstory whatsoever that didn't occur in the last three days. Yeah, it's like the opposite of we'll get into Kenobi at some point. This is probably going to run long. but yeah, it is. Kenobi should have been, in my opinion, should have been a movie. The solo movie should have been a TV show. Yes. Where it was like serialized, you know, it, it, it was almost like designed to be a TV show, especially if you're going to do the forced, here's how Han got his socks, here's how Han got his yep. watch. Like, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Like the old, the, the, um, I never saw it, but I've seen clips of it, the old Indiana Jones show where it's an old Indiana the Jones. Indiana Jones, yeah. Telling stories about his youth. Yep. It could have just been that, him yep. talking to Kylo or something. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, that would have went well. <laughs> right before he gets stabbed. Yeah. He's like, Wayne, I have to tell you all these things about my past. <laughs> uh, fortunately, after that came out and it was a, I mean. It flopped, right? It it, it made, it was profitable at the box office. So I can't call it a financial failure. Oh, I thought it was a financial failure. No, but from a creative standpoint, it was a terrible failure. I mean, the writing was weak. Well, that also, that was one of the ones where they had director issues because it right. was Ron they, Howard. They and swapped then, out directors in the middle of I it. I think it was the Lego movie guys, right? Miller it and Lord? Might have been. I forget who the original one was. Yeah. It also didn't help that they cast someone that looked nothing like Harrison Ford, sounded anything like Harrison Ford, walked like Harrison. Like, he had no resemblance to the character itself. They, like, almost deliberately picked somebody that didn't fit the part so bad as almost like a slap in the face to to fans. Yeah, I mean, I I don't I'm kind of I don't know where I come down on that cuz I don't want I'm okay with act like people performing it in their own way, but if you're doing a prequel story, they should at least like <sighs> pretend like they're that person eventually or where you can see those elements of where they will get to that point. Like uh Donald Glover was good as oh Lando. Oh my god, he was the highlight of the entire movie. But he was pretty clearly just doing a Billy Dee impersonation. <laughs> he was. So <laughs> But that's the problem. You're playing an existing character. Like, if you get cast to play George Washington in a movie, mm. you damn well better look and sound like George Washington. <laughs> that's okay? fair, I guess. Otherwise, it's called Hamilton. True, okay? true. <laughs> but uh, I think we're getting a Lando show eventually, right? We probably are. We'll talk about that. Though. <laughs> but anyway, so they learned their lesson here. They backed off from the movies. Disney Plus came out, and they moved into streaming. Um. So the what they encounter was was some Disney fatigue. They encountered some Star Wars fatigue, which I think Disney was surprised at because they kind of went down that same path with Star Wars that they did with Marvel, and the fans ate up everything Marvel that came out and they loved it, and I think it backfired on Star Wars. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, it fr- sure seems that way. I'm, I certainly feel the fatigue. But I think the reason that happens is because at a certain point, there's only so many stories you can tell in the Star Wars universe, right? Especially when you limit yourselves like they constantly do with all these movies and TV shows where they, they very rarely try something different, something that breaks the mold. And I think that that kind of makes... It limits the amount of things you can do, and I think that's where a lot of the fatigue come from. Where, like, with Marvel, you'll get a, a Ragnarok, a Thor Ragnarok, you'll get a, a Guardians, movies that do things that are kind of weird and out there because they're allowed to be. But, like, there's really nothing like that with Star Wars. Maybe we'll get the... Uh, Taika Waititi's making a show, we'll get something like that, maybe. But I think if you look at the the broad, uh, you know, selection of what we have to view of Star Wars, it's all pretty similar. <laughs> and, I, and I agree with you 100% there. I think with Marvel... You can get away with that because Marvel, let's face it, Marvel combined several different properties yep. that, that no one ever thought they'd be able to combine. And when, genres. Yeah. Well, when, when Guardians of the Galaxy came out and we were told that they're going to merge in with Avengers, I'm like, how are you going to do that? Right. Like, one's almost an adult version of Marvel merging in with the kid version. Like, none of that's going to work. And they wound up making it work. Mm-hmm. You brought in brilliant 
out of the box thinkers like Taika Watiti, who I love everything that he does. Mm -hmm. He comes in and gives us a comedy that fits into everything that's like a flash from the 1970s with with everything yeah. that he does. So you could get away with that. And I think Disney found out that the Star Wars fans are too rigid for that. They're too loyal to what the nostalgia of it is. And they're big on the nostalgia. Yeah, I think that's part of the problem. And I, I try to break myself of that because like with with Marvel, it's like if you want a spy story, you can go watch Winter Soldier. If you want a, a Western, there's I blanked on one, but you know what I mean. There's there's a genre for a movie for everything, and I think if they did that with Star Wars, it'd be a lot more successful and a lot more, at least creatively interesting to watch. Because if because you can do those things with Star Wars. I mean, we we see Mando and Book of Boba Fett. They love the Western trope. They get into that, but you can make it work in other genres. I, I've only watched a handful of episodes of Visions, uh, the animated show where that, where they did a bunch of short stories. But that that was another example of where you could have done all these different genre type stories in star wars make a noir make a make a war movie which yep. you got a little bit of a war movie in solo for like 15 minutes but the point is you don't have to be creatively you know out of ideas because you limit yourself based on your nostalgia you can do all these other stories in star wars if you just do it right and make new characters and make new settings and you know kind of blaze a new path that isn't so uh like rigid and, and, and you know stuck to itself and ultimately, I think the problem boils down to the fact that Disney did not know the fan base of Star Wars. And I think they're just finally starting to learn that because you're starting to see things that are different. Mm -hmm. But they're not dramatically different, nor are they canonically impacting on the overall story, which is where Visions comes in. And Visions, every, with the exception of, I think, two or three of the, of the episodes of it, Every episode of it is different. It's a different style. It's a different story. It's a mm -hmm. different impact. It's a different time period. And they do a really good job of that. And the fans accepted it. Because it's a little bit at a time. A little bit at a time. You can't just come in and, and throw mm -hmm. a uh, Thor Ragnarok in there. Because the Star Wars fans just aren't going to accept that. Yeah. So you kind of have to lead them down that path. And, and going back to what I was saying about doing different genre type stories in Star Wars, that's one of the re reasons I like the Clone Wars show so much, the the animated one, not the Gendi Tartakovsky one, because they did that in that show constantly. They would take, you know, an arc, they'd take three or four episodes and make like a, a murder mystery, or they'd mm -hmm. make like a, a western, or they'd make a, you know, or a horror. They did yeah. a horror series with it. Yeah, and, and it really showed that Star Wars doesn't have to be the same thing all the time. You can take these tropes, and that, I mean, really, the original trilogy, at least New Hope, was like that too, you know. Lucas being inspired by Kurosawa and things like that. It, it was all and um, Campbell's hero's journey thing, the yep. circle. Like it, it's all just taking big idea stories and putting them in a sci-fi fantasy setting. And you can do that more if you don't limit yourself as much. I agree. And I think Disney is finally getting to the point where they're hitting their stride and they're learning how to do that. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back and we're going to talk about the current state of Star Wars. We'll be right back. For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. That's our subject today. We're going to talk a little bit more about the current state of Star Wars. So the properties that we have available right now, and I'll run down the list real quick, that are currently active. We have Mandalorian, which is filming Season 3. We have Bad Batch, which is in post-production for Season 2. 
We have the book of everyone but Bo. I mean, the book of Boba Fett, which uh, has finished its limited run. They're making more of that. No. Oh, okay, good. It's finished its limited run. I know, but it's the ongoing section. I thought I had missed some announcements. Well, or it's something. current. We also have Obi Wan that finished its run <coughs> too. Mm -hmm. So that's what we have available to us to watch right now, plus all the other stuff that came out. Where do we stand with with Mandalorian? What do you What do you think of it now? We're We're going into our third season here. Is it still worth watching? Absolutely. I'd argue to say it might be the only thing worth watching. <laughs> it's, it's probably, and I was going to say this conclusion for the end of the show, but it's probably the only thing I'm going to be watching going here on out. I, I just, I am i can't do it anymore. But I like The Mandalorian. I think season one and two, while they have their flaws and they have their problems, I think by season two especially, they really figured it out. Um, some say they go a little heavy with the cameos from other shows and things like that, but I think at its core, Jin Dejarin? Din Djarin, whatever his name is, Din the Mandalorian. Din Djarin. Din Djarin. <laughs> I, think, I think that character is great, and I think that it's really something positive that's come out of this new era of Star Wars. Grogu, I can take it or leave it. I'm not a big Grogu guy. I know people are, but it's fine. Um, and I think that that crew, that cast of characters that they've got in there, whoever's left, I know some people got booted for having bad beliefs in real life, um, but they've, they've done a good job crafting that universe, and I think that that show going forward... I think it could only go up, really. And, and I agree. I think it's probably the highlight. It has reinvigorated people's interest in Star Wars. Um, they've used it as a springboard to basically create multiple spinoffs from. Um, I was disappointed at what everyone describes as, as season 2.5 of The Mandalorian, which was the tail end of oh, yeah. Boba Fett, Book of Boba Fett, where we thought... You know, the whole storyline with Baby Yoda, Grogu was gone, and now he's back in the picture. And I think that's a mistake because I think continued emphasis, even though everyone loves the cute little Baby Yoda, I think continued emphasis on that character is going to be a drain on any storyline that's that's out there. I always knew Baby Yoda was going to come back. I did think we'd he get... He had to because he makes so much money for exactly. him. Exactly. If you want to look at it cynically, yes. you can. I'm sure you can look around this room and see Baby Yoda merch somewhere. <laughs> some behind you. Yeah. Um, he makes way too much money and he, he's way too marketable. They're never going to get rid of him. However, I thought we'd at least get... I wasn't expecting 2.5 in Book of Boba Fett. That kind of... I wasn't either. That was like wild. But I thought we'd maybe get like half a season of Mando without him. And then, you know, maybe he has like some other adventure with something else. And then he comes back. But no, he's back right away. Yep, right off the bat. And I think that's a mistake, unfortunately. Yeah, because it's going to, what are you going to do? You already did, you concluded that whole arc. Yeah. I guess it would be, now it's it's uh, Mandalorian reclaiming his Mandalorian-ness, right? That almost sounds obscene when you say that. <laughs> well, no, because like, didn't in, in that episode of Boba Fett, he gets kicked out. He, right, he gets kicked out. By the other two living Mandalorians that are left. Right, well, and they're not the only living Mandalorians oh. left. They're the, they're the one living ones from the Death Watch. But I'm hoping we get, because we already had, um, what's her name? Bo-Katan, right? right. So she, she's obviously going to be back. So yeah, I'm, I'm hoping I like the Mandalorian stuff in general, like the the Mandalorian. It's a great, it's a great, and everyone loves Mandalorians. Like yeah. that's the thing. It's that they're like the Klingons of, mm -hmm. of Star Wars. Everyone just loves how rich their heritage is. Yeah, so I'm hoping we get more of that. I I, I much prefer it as uh, now, especially with the Mandalorian, because I like the characters. I prefer it much more when it's every episode is connected to the overall plot. I'm not big on like the whole serialized thing, which you kind of got more in. That was more season that one, was right? season one, yeah. Yeah, but when they started moving to season two where things were more connected and they told one long story, I much prefer that. And I hope that they stick with that and there's not as much, you know, one-off episodes unless they're, you know, interesting. Well, the only concern that I have in the direction that they're going is they're probably going to have to lend some support, some tertiary support to some of the other shows. So we already oh, yeah. know they're feeding into the Ahsoka mm -hmm. series, right? So they're doing... they. The whole Grogu cloning, uh, Admiral Thrawn type stuff. So they're already feeding into that. I don't know what else they'll be feeding into, but because it originated with Mandalorian, it's there almost like a Iron Man. Yeah, it's 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 what the whole Disney Plus stuff is circulating around right now. So you're probably still going to have some drain on the resources for that. I mean, yeah, that's how all these shows work. It's it's. We're going to name the show after a character, but then we're going to introduce a bunch of other characters along the way and give them time so that they can have their own show so that we can keep stringing people along. <laughs> right. And that's that's good business. What about uh, Bad Batch? Uh, What's your thoughts? And and who's the character, the young one here? Rekka? 
No. Omega? Omega. I had to get you to say <laughs> oh, it. Yeah, Omega. Uh, I liked Bad Batch a lot. It was way too long. I can't believe it was like a full season of Clone Wars where it was like 23 episodes. Yeah. That was ridiculous. However, if we can keep making, and they're doing that with... Um, you know you're scraping the bottom of the barrel when you got the kid in there scamming card games. Yeah. And you're putting that into yeah. an episode. I, I, They should have taken the approach of the Clone Wars final season where it was short. I'm a big advocate of everything should be short, but I, I really like the Clone Wars animation. I've come to really like it, and especially with that final season of Clone Wars, they've really stepped up the budget, and it looks, like, incredible. Yeah. Um, and I like keeping in that universe with the clones. I always think that those were some of the best stories coming out of Clone Wars, and I, I just like that style of show continuing. Um, that being said, like I said, it was way too long. It had, you know, a lot of episodes that you could have just not had in the show. Uh, and it had a similar thing like with Mando where it was kind of – it became a cameo of the week show at a certain point. Um, but unfortunately, I just think that's all the Star Wars shows at this point so that we can get people to stay interested. Right. right. you um, got to sell shows. you got to sell merchandise. But I'm looking forward to the new season of it. And, uh, yeah, I just I just really like that – that not a genre, but, you know, those types of shows. And when we're getting more of that with uh, – what's it called? Tales of the Jedi? Tales of the right. Jedi, I think. See, the one thing that I did like about it is the fact that – Clone Wars always showed you Star Wars from a different perspective. It wasn't from the lead character perspective. It was from the guys down the bottom, right? Mm -hmm. Bad Batch does that, but it does that at a critical period of time. Seeing mm -hmm. Order 66 from their perspective was awesome. Yep. Seeing how people react to Imperial troops now, you get a whole different perspective on what that period of time is like. It's one of the most interesting periods in Star Wars, too, seeing that transition from the Republic to the Empire. Absolutely. And you never get a chance to see that anywhere else. This is the first time you got to see that. You got to see, you know, little bits of it here and there with, you know, a new hope. But, like, Fall you, order. you had no interaction. But, again, video games. I want, no. want to stay away from the video games because it's a small segment of the population. This opens it up to more people, and this adds more character, more color, and more grit to that mm -hmm. time period, and it's going to support everything moving forward, which is what I like about it. Yeah, definitely. Book of Boba, what are your thoughts on it? It was so, it's such a disappointment. It really was. It, and it was one of those shows that put another coffin in the nail of me stop watching these shows because it was just – it felt like such a waste of time. I, I think that it was it, it was structured poorly – I really don't know what they were doing with it. I, it seems like they didn't really either. It seemed like the whole thing was just a con to get to the Mandalorian stuff at the end. I, I really don't know what else to say about it. It, it just – you can definitely skip it because Boba yeah. Fett doesn't really do anything. <laughs> yeah, and I, like the first four episodes are nothing but flashbacks of how he survives the, the Sarlacc, which once he shows up in Mandalorian, you kind of have to answer that question. Mm -hmm. um, how he forgot that he left his armor – there, when he got out, I, I don't understand that. There was a lot of inconsistencies in it, but you're right. It's a it's a series that did not need to be created. Why Boba Fett, a bounty hunter, would want to be a crime lord on Tatooine, still don't understand the, the concept behind that. Why he aligned himself with a gang of teenagers who rode really mm. flashy motorcycle bikes yeah. i don't understand that either like and, and you say it's a show that doesn't need to exist but it also didn't justify its own existence that's the thing you yeah. can have things that don't need to exist but are still fun to watch but with boba fett it, it didn't need to exist and you didn't need to watch it no you're right and i think you hit the nail on the head that the only reason it existed was to give you mandalorian season 2.5 mm -hmm. which we could have all waited for that to be you know, an episode or two in season three. Yeah, we, we talked about this off the air before, but it should have been the reverse where it's a season of Mandalorian with a Boba Fett episode. Sure. Not a season of a Boba Fett show with a Mandalorian episode because you easily could have, you. I mean, let's be real, you could have crammed this whole book of Boba Fett show into an episode or two of a Mandalorian season. And, you know, you could have, you know, where's Boba at now? Because, you know, he was a character in the show, basically. Right. And I wouldn't be surprised if we do get that in the new Mandalorian season where we get more on Boba. Well, and the, the, the ultimate problem that I have is everybody from Boba, from Mandalorian is getting their own, their own series. It's like even the bartender at that, yeah. that nowhere, you know, town that they've had Cobb Vanth is getting his own series. I'm surprised Cobb Vanth doesn't have his own series yet. It's like. Well, he's gonna. He's a robot now. But it's it's like they're telegraphing it at this point in time. It's like back in the 1980s when you had all these spinoffs of these original shows. It's like it's it's too much. Like if you want to come up with additional shows because you need to fill airtime on Disney right, Plus, right. come up with something original. 
Well, it's funny you call it airtime because that is what it feels like. It feels like they're like it's like cable TV and they have to fill this airtime when in reality they could put on there whatever they want. Well, they're trying to get people to maintain their subscriptions to it. And they think it, content is king. You got to throw content out there, whether it's good or not, so that people can consume something. And and that's kind of why I've fallen off. I just can't do it anymore. It's just none of this feel. It's all and you know you you don't want to limit yourself to a numbering system, but for the sake of this, I'm going to. Everything feels like a six or a seven out of ten. None of this feels like I it is much must watch TV. Nothing's really doing anything different. It's all just very middle of the road, and it's just. It all just feels like it's stringing me along as a viewer, and I'm Marvel is doing that too. By the way, I, I don't think I mentioned that on the air, but I, I've stopped watching the Marvel shows, and I'm probably going to stop watching the Star Wars shows, except for Mandalorian. And I think you're right, and I think it's a it's a race to mediocrity at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't think I think it's our fault as a consumer because the more and, and it's always been this way. If you look at TV and radio, whatever, the more crap they put out there, the more we want to consume it. Yep. And now they can tie direct numbers to it because they've got subscriber numbers. We're paying for this crap now. It's not just that we're sitting there watching advertisements. Mm-hmm. We're paying them to put this stuff out there. Yep. And that was kind of the conclusion I came to is that I'm part of the problem. By, yeah. by watching all these shows and by paying for Disney+, Plus, I am contributing to the thing that I hate. <laughs> so I've decided to try to remove myself from the equation. So finally in this segment, let's have our discussion about obi-wan the series this is what this whole triggered this whole idea of this podcast give me your thoughts and then you and i can argue (laughs) (laughs) uh well i liked it uh i do think it i don't think it needed to be a show um i'll just say that i think could have been a two and a half hour long movie um but they couldn't have gotten six weeks of programming out of it if they didn't do that (laughs) um i think the first two episodes started off very strong i think a lot of the Obi-Wan stuff, with a few exceptions, was pretty good. But I think when you get into everything else in the show, it, it all felt like extra fluff that didn't really need to be there. Um, the character of Reva, I didn't really like it first. By the end, I kind of was a little bit higher on her when she sort of showing more emotion other than just being angry. And the twist of her hunting Vader was good. Uh, all the Vader stuff, I thought, did a pretty good job. You get to see Vader be a, a crazy murderer, which everybody loves. You get a lot of good Vader moments in that. I think there's some parts that don't really help at all like all the stuff with the grand inquisitor uh, that didn't need to be in there a lot of the stuff with a lot of the other rebels he meets really didn't need to be in there unless they show up in that rangers of the republic show that's coming out which is what it felt like it felt like an ad for that show oh they're gonna show up on andor probably too oh yeah that too yeah um but oh a little leia was great i thought that that was a great twist that I, i didn't see coming that was really well done and consistently paid off throughout the show um, but yeah, I, I definitely think it could have just been a movie and it would have had more impact if it was a movie. And you know what? I don't disagree with anything what you said. I was happy that the whole damn thing didn't happen on Tatooine like everything else <laughs> in the Star Wars universe seems to. Um, I would suggest the next time they decide to have a lightsaber fight, you need to have more lighting than just the two lightsabers because you couldn't see shit during the fight. That was a problem. Um, and the recreating the Ahsoka fight between Vader and Ahsoka from Clone Wars probably, or from Rebels, probably wasn't necessary because you already saw that fight once and it was almost an identical walk for walk through that fight. So that was kind of disappointing. Um, How did you leave Reva alive? She's redeemed. It's fine. Is she? Really? I thought she was going to off herself. I don't know. Like, I don't know what our censorship's like on the show, but I thought she was going to unalive herself. Uh, I, I don't know how... As Obi-Wan, you could let somebody who is a Grand Inquisitor who now knows about Luke and Leia yeah. live. Well, because she has to have her own show. <laughs> it's the same reason you let Vader live, because he had to, because that's what the writing dictated. Well, well, no, from a canonical timeline, you kind of had to let him live. Well, that, but how do you walk away from that? Like, you literally have a chance right there. Mm-hmm. You thought you killed him before. And you walked away, and he was still breathing, and you thought he was going to die. How do you walk away from him again after doing that? I was, I was telling a friend of mine we were talking about it, and I was like, he, big Batman energy with this, where like he has him dead the rights, and he just lets him live, even though he knows that he's going to go on to kill thousands of people. And it's right. like, but like, didn't we know this going into the show, right? When, we, when they confirmed Vader was going to be in it, and they confirmed they were going to fight, we all knew how it was going to end. No, Neither of them are going to die. Right. That's what happens when you milk every... Sp- like moment of this timeline, but you already know the end in the beginning. These things are inevitable. I, I think if anything, they should have done 
you remember in Force Awakens when Rey and Kylo fight and then an earthquake happened and they're split apart? Something right. like that. Like so- Well, and it's funny you mention that because I was having a conversation with a colleague at work and we said, okay, so we know there's two battles. We know that uh, Obi-Wan is going to at least win the last one because you have to in order to fit the line from A New Hope of when, when last we met, you were the master. So we now know that he had to win that last fight. But everybody else besides Vader thought that Obi-Wan was dead. Even Tarkin says, oh, he, he's, you know, he's long dead, right? Mm. So the way the battle should have ended was Vader lost, but somehow came up with a way to conceivably explain how, how Obi-Wan dies. And he, he basically lies. And says, oh, I kill- he kicked my ass, but I killed him and he's gone now. Mm-hmm. Knowing that he's alive himself, but everyone else thinks he's dead. That's what should have happened. And the Kylo Ren thing with the earth splitting would have been a great way to do that. Yeah. I thought that's what they were going to do when they dropped him in the pit and threw yep. the rocks on top of him. Yep. Um, they could have even done that because you get the Ian McDermott cameo, which is great. He's always great. Um, not necessary, but great. No, it didn't do anything for the show. <laughs> but you could have had that moment where... Because basically, Palpatine just shows up and goes, you mad? You look a little mad. <laughs> but he could have said, like, that's where he could have had the moment you're talking about where he lies right. and says, I got him. He's right. dead, you know? Because then you know he's lying to the Emperor. He's lying and to... And that would have set it up perfectly. Yep. That's That would have made so much more sense. <laughs> yep. But, Instead um, of, oh, no, Obi-Wan just, he left him with a broken mask and left. Yep. It makes no sense that you would just walk away. I know. And that's what happens when you limit yourself and you make a prequel because they love prequels. And like when you when you do these things and you you tie yourself down to these conclusions that like you can't get out of. Right. I mean, like, <laughs> there's no way to get out of this. <sighs> no, but, you're right. You're right. You kind of have to talk your way around it. But the question is, is this show must see Star Wars? I would say it is because I like Obi-Wan. And I would say it is because I like Darth Vader. <laughs> yeah. So just for the fight alone and seeing Darth Vader's power, yeah, I would say it is. Yeah, I, I really he has a good fight with Reva too. That was fun. Um, I wish we would have gotten a little bit more. Yeah, the fight, the the saberless fight with yeah. with Reva was awesome. Yeah. Um, a little bit more Vader character stuff. We, well, my question to you is: Are we going to get a Vader series out of this now? God, I hope not. Because, because Hayden Christian had, had suggested... He's got nothing going on. Don't listen to he's Hayden He's available. <laughs> yeah, I know. He's available. But like... I, but that's the moneymaker. That's, that's Grogu. I know. You could, you could make a series of Darth Vader going to the bathroom and people would watch it and pay to watch it. If they're going to do a Vader show, they should just do the Vader comics... Because those like make him a real human being. Where like when Palpatine, they do, but I don't want to get Doctor Afra in. Oh, in I don't. I don't I'm not talking about that. Like when Palpatine strands him on the planet, or like with nothing, and like he has to fight Tarkin and stuff like that. Like all those little one-off things. I could see that. The like the they did the the Sith Lords book that would make a great series that you could do. Yeah, because the problem is like at least in the movies and TV, because that's the only thing I've seen. Because I don't really, I've only seen, I uh, read some of the comics, but like Vader is just like a crazy bad guy at this point he's just like a mass murderer Mm -hmm. and that's hard to make a main character of your show because he's just like murdering people all the time like what are you going to do with him like uh, and in the comics you get more of his depth where like sure he has his own motivations and he's he's overcoming his own insecurities and things like that to become the vader we see in new hope you get much more depth character development yeah in the written but even in obi-wan he's basically just a crazy murderer the whole time except for a few moments where we see anakin come through but even then he doubled down he doubles down that was very well done by the way especially cutting between the voices as the voices are coming back and forth that was really well done and i like i I, we talked about this before we came on, but there was a, there's a lot of great lines in that finale that I really, really liked. Um, I like how he calls him Darth. Obi-Wan calls him Darth before he leaves. Like he says, yeah, only yeah. master of evil, Darth and, and New Hope. So it's like he's finally accepting that Anakin's dead. But even then, it's like, come on, just, just stab him, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like at least stab him and walk away and have him survive it. Because like you we know. already established the Grand Inquisitor survived it. And Reva. Right. So that would have been a great way to think he killed him again. Yeah, I mean, he could even cut him in half. You could do pretty much anything. You could cut him in because he's done that before and the guy <laughs> survived too. So. Yeah. And threw him down a pit. See, so. that would have been even – because does – I don't know. I'm not familiar. I haven't seen A New Hope in a while. Does Obi-Wan know 
Vader's alive and like is Anakin in New Hope? Like, does he know him? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, because I was gonna say it would have been interesting if he killed but, Vader. That's why he Luke there. confronts him where after he tells oh, him, okay, yeah, Darth Vader betrayed and murdered your father. That's where they get the line from. Mm. You know, Anakin Skywalker's dead. I killed him. Oh, that's a great way to explain that to your son in 10 years. All right, thanks for that. Yeah. Because I was going to say he could have thought, he legitimately thought he killed Vader only to have him reappear later, but that probably wouldn't have worked. I don't know. I I, I still think that show is worth watching. Uh, you know, there's there's definitely a lot of parts in it that didn't need to be in there, but I think especially if you're a fan of the prequels and if you're a Vader fan, you basically get the payoff of Obi-Wan because, like, he shows up in Rebels as, like, old man Ben and does some stuff, but, like, not... It's not like character development. He's kind of just there. Right. Um, but if you want the conclusion to, especially coming off of Revenge of the Sith, because they really but like pay into that a lot, um, I think it's worth watching just for that. I agree. It's it's definitely worth... The the cinematics, I think, are, are worth watching. And the story's oh, I do critical. I do want to mention that. We are starting to see the limit of this LED wall that they shoot everything on because everything looks flat. And you can see that in the Thor trailer, too. There's some shots of that that look flat. You can really see it in this Obi-Wan show when they're on that rock planet. You can tell that it's like where they are is real, but everything else around them is very flat. And that's kind of the downfall of, I forget what it's called. The volume. Yeah. That's kind of the downfall of that tech. And I get it. It's Star Wars. The prequels, we were pushing the limits of what tech could do, and we're kind of doing that again. But, like, I well, think they're... What was funny was, and they... I don't know if you watched a documentary, if you hadn't no. seen stuff from anything. They talk about the volume. And the purpose of the volume wasn't to create the dynamic backgrounds. It was to create the lighting mm. from the backgrounds. And then they were going to digitally uh, overwrite the backgrounds. Okay. Like a green screen. Yeah. But at least now you've got those realistic, that sun beating down or the fire coming up from the, from the lava mm -hmm. river from the finale of season one. You have that effect. And you have something for the actors to react against. Even um, Carl Weathers says they're in this boat on this made-up floor with everything going on, and the scene is passing by. He said he was getting motion sick. He mm. wasn't moving, but was getting motion sick because That's of neat. the real. So it was a, it was a tool for the actors and for the visual effects guys, but it looked so good for what they were doing. They left it in mm. so many of the shots. The one thing to take note, though, is you've got a, a couple of, and we're not going to go into this last segment here because we're up against the clock now, but I just want to touch a couple things. You've got Andor coming out. Mm -hmm. Well, Andor's not using the volume. Oh, Andor really? Andor is using all practical effects. Good. They're building their sets. They're building their props. They're doing everything like a traditional movie. Um, and it was very similar to what they did with the TV series of Halo. And you can tell the difference. Yep. When you open a door, and it's a, it's a door. It's not a panel with green on it that they overprint mm -hmm. digital stuff on it looks and, and and acts like it's real yeah that's good because i'm definitely like i i mean I, I brought it up but i'm feeling the limits of this volume technology and i'm hoping they don't because it makes everything feel flat but like end of the day that's kind of just what it does and when you're doing outdoor panoramic shots like that it doesn't always work yeah where it works is when you're enclosed somewhere and you don't need that depth mm -hmm. but when you're looking at a shot in a desert and you've got rocks in the foregrounds and rocks out medium and rocks out you do you lose that depth that perception yeah. of depth so i'm hoping they either you know they they kind of work out on that or i didn't realize andor was being shot all practically double down on that practically is almost always better in my opinion it is but it costs a fortune true true so. <laughs> yeah just raise the price of disney plus there you go <laughs> so yeah we're at the one hour mark and in this last section was actually going to be the longest section so i think we're going to hold off on that for another episode part two uh, we'll, we can do a part two of Help Me Obi Wan. Uh, Does that mean we... I have to watch Andor? <laughs> <laughs> uh, not if we do it quick. If we do it in the next week or two, you should be <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, so we'll come back and we'll talk about the future of Star Wars on another episode. Um, any closing thoughts before we go, though? Um, no, I pretty much said everything. You know, I think I, I think after Obi Wan, because I think if if they didn't get above a 7 out of 10 with Obi-Wan, I don't think anything's going to. Yeah. So I think I'm going to bail. I've already bailed on Marvel shows. I think I'm going to bail on on Star Wars shows, except for Mandalorian. I'll come back for Mandalorian. It's going to make it hard to get you back on an entertainment podcast <laughs> if you're not going to watch anything. I know, I know. Unless, I don't know, they always put these articles out to try to get people to watch. Of like, you'll never believe who showed up in Andor episode 2. <laughs> so if, if someone spoils it for me and it's something I actually enjoy, maybe I'll go and watch it. But I just... 
I just don't see the point. It all just feels like they're stringing me along, you know, and I, I, I'm I think I'm I pulling the plug. That. I don't see for me there's 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 nothing else to watch right now. There's nothing else compelling for me to watch where I don't have the time to, to ingest this. And it's Star Wars. I feel compelled to sure. ingest Star Wars. It's understandable. So, but that is it for our show today. Uh, before we go, I once again want to invite our listening and viewing audience to subscribe to the podcast. You can find audio versions of this podcast listed as Insights in Entertainment. Audio and video versions of all of our podcasts can be found listed as Insights into Things. We're on TuneIn, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, anywhere you can get a podcast these days. I would also invite you to write in, give us your feedback. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can find us on Twitter at insights underscore things. Uh, you can find, uh, we stream five days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things where you can find links to all those and more on our official website, www.insightsintothings.com. That's it. Another one in the books. Bye.